Thank you, Pastor Ward um, and Pastor David for this wonderful opportunity again to share our morning and our afternoon back here in Fresno. Um, we can't think of a better time to be. We love what's happening in America, the Word of God, and we love being part of the fellowship that we've been involved in for many years and have been born in the fellowship. So it's been a life but to be here today like this is really a real, real blessing. So I want to talk about uh, calling upon the Lord and different ways of a calling. Um, in Australia, look at the history of our country. 1915, we had the uh, the ANZACs formed in Gallipoli, an acronym for Australian New Zealand Army Corps, ANZAC. And before that, there was an, a, a call out for recruitments. So there's some young men in uh, Western Australia and also New South Wales and down in Tasmania started a march and it was called uh, called Kui, Kui, C W O W E E. It's an Aboriginal word. And a lot of the trackers in uh, the beginnings of Australian history when the outback was being formed, they would employ trackers to lead them through the outback of Australia. And they were able to whistle, we go like this, across the valleys of the uh, outback in Australia. It would just reverberate, echo right out. So if anybody was lost, uh, they could kind of yell that back and, and they would be found. So uh, that was like a calling in the, in the jungles or the forests of, of Australia. Um, and so they adopted that phrase known as the Kui March. So in 1915, these men were walking, marching towards Sydney, and ended up being about 1,500 men to enlist and to go over to, over to Europe to defend the nation and the British Empire and all that, British expedition forces. And they were known as the Kiwi. If you want to practice that in, in, in your own home <laughs> in America, but good luck. Um, so that's a calling. Calling to arms, a call to arms, a call to help um, defend the nation. That was what that calling was about. In, in 1940, <clears throat> in another calling, um, we might turn to that one. It's in Daniel in chapter 3. You can, and I'll tell you another example of a calling, but I'm going to use this reference in the Bible. Daniel chapter 3. And it was in 1940, between the dates of May 25th and June 4th, on the beaches of Dunkirk, which is known now, we call it still recognised as the miracle of Dunkirk. So there was one man trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk. He signalled to a, he was a naval officer, and he signals the code to a, a receiver of the code message, not a code, a message from the beaches of, of Dunkirk, where 330,000 British expedition forces were trapped. Uh, the Germans were coming in in their Panzer Division to, uh, and the British expedition forces comprising of French, Belgium, um, and the British on the beaches of Dunkirk had nowhere to go, they were trapped. There was no reserve forces in, in the British um, Empire. To lose these men would mean probably would have lost the war. Now, I digress, man. I'm not anti pro German or uh, British. Um, my wife's got German in her, Pastor John Kuhlman, K U H L M A N N. Um, Pastor John's brother, uncle was called Adolf Kuhlman, and he was in Port Lincoln, one of the country towns in South Australia. He was a cray fisherman, and he was walking his walking down the path down to check his crow pots in the rivers the beach there at Paul Lincoln and, and the locals reported to the warden that um, Adolf Kuhlman was sending special signals by the lantern to the submarine, the German submarine in South Australia. <laughs> um, so Adolf Kuhlman was interned for the rest of the war. So we're not pro German but I've got German relatives now. My Daughter's married to a German, my other daughter's married to a German, so we've got German surrounding it in my family. So, by way of a description. 
So the Germans had surrounded all these uh, British expedition forces. And a British naval officer sent a message back to London. And he said just three words in the code. And it's in verse, chapter three, verse 18. This is the call. Be it. But if not, but if not, that was the code. The London officer at the time of the 1904 is a lot more understanding of the Bible. He immediately recognized this was a scripture. And the scripture was in reference to verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king they were about to put into a fiery furnace. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, verse 17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods nor worship the gold image which thou hast set up. So this British naval officer sent out three words to London, if not. And immediately this officer was saying, we are trapped, we're surrounded, we have no way out or support, defend the last man. And then it ended up being a, an armada of 913 private boats that went across the channel, the calm waters of the North Sea at the time, which was a miracle. There was a fog that was pouring across the channel, and there was a canopy that they could go across. The Luftwaffe were not able to fly, and there had been an order from Adolf Hitler, the hands of the division, to stop, not to cross the, the canal that was surrounded the city of Dunkirk, which was a beach resort town. And when the fog lifted, all the men on that beach were saved. So that was another calling. It was a calling of, of desperate need at the time. And we've got double prophecy that we can look at another time. But the principle of calling out for help, in this case, was done by a code. And with three words, but if not, if not, it was recognised by the receiver of that code, we will defend to the last man. Recently, was a Bunnings a garden centre in Adelaide. And I came, I was in my old couple there in the mid 80s and I got talking to them and, and uh, he, he's a British guy and I said, oh, I've been about the miracle of Dunkirk and he said, I was there. And um, I said, is it the miracle? He goes, oh yeah, whatever you read about, it's different to actually being there. I said, how did you survive? I said, I was being, there was Germans on the beaches, but um, he said, I was running through the sand dunes and there was a dead uh, German officer in the sand and, and I was being chased by some Germans. So I picked up his body and I put it over my back. And I stood there as though I was going to the toilet. And these German soldiers ran past me and he, he said, I grabbed his arm and I went, oh, Hitler. And um, they ran through and he survived. And he got spirit filled, baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, as did his wife. Um, but it was just an amazing little snapshot of, of um, people, real people being caught on this beach and how that, in a way, God delivered them. And in this, this man's case, he was delivered for a reason because later in his life, him and his wife would get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And the whole piece of why he survived made sense. So when we call upon the Lord, we go back to First Samuel, if we can, in chapter 3. When we call upon the Lord, we've got those callings of Kiwi Cobber or Kiwi, who are armed to war, and they go out and help and defend, and a call for help from the. Uh, but if not, we will defend. There's a call out there, we're in trouble, but we're going to defend. When God calls us, there are three things He wants to do. Number one, in Psalm 50. Verse 15, it talks about without, uh, you don't have to turn to it, call upon me in a day of trouble and I'll deliver you and, I'll, and you'll glorify me. So the first thing that God wants to do is prove himself to us in our hour of need. And then from that, we learn about God's character and then we tell people about the character and the nature of God. 
I remember being in the world calling out to God for help in my hour of need. I was one particular time I was very heavily involved in drugs and this particular day and I called out to God for help and he answered me. And then later on in my life, like even today, I'm able to tell you that I called out to God in my day of trouble. And I'm also able to tell you how great that was a feeling. Therefore, the Lord says, He'll glor- we will glorify him. The first thing he wants to do is prove himself to us so that we can tell of his nature, his character. Uh, then in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, the children of Israel were trapped in those groanings and crying out to the Lord and their bondage. And he, he heard their cries and he delivered them and he had respect unto their call. And that calling was a reminder too that he had promised Abraham that he would be a great people. He promised Abraham the promised land, descendants, and he promised his, he, he would, his families, his, his seed would fill all the families of the earth. So that calling then was also one where the Lord's going to say, when you call upon me, I want you to know that my promises are real. So we're, it's a calling where we're, we're reminded and we're told to rely upon his promises that he gives us. And in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, it says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. When we call upon the Lord, he reveals his plan and his purpose for our lives. When we call upon the Lord, we know one thing. God wants us to call upon him because he wants to help us. He really cares about us. He wants us to boast about his character afterwards. When we call upon the Lord, learning about his promises are real. This is Abraham's promise, which manifested when the children of Israel were in bondage. And he shows us great and mighty things that we didn't even know existed about God, Bible prophecy, his coming, his outpouring of the Holy Ghost, his promise of healing, all the things that we get and that many of us didn't know about and his plan and purpose in our lives. So he opens up to us the kingdom of God when we call upon him here. And Samuel, he, had a, he was a young boy, a wonderful mum that um, was in business of soul, she couldn't have children, and the Lord was gracious enough to bless her with his child. And she lent him to the Lord, it says in, in chapter one and two, without just for time, because we had a hot day. Um, so Samuel's now a little boy in verse one, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, people were not walking properly with God. And verse three, the ear of the lamp went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. The Lord called Samuel and said, here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I didn't call you, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And Samuel called yet again. Sorry, the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here, here am I, for you did call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. That's where we're at with Samuel. He's hearing this voice, it's at night, he doesn't know the Lord, lamp's gone out, he's in a dark place, the nation's in a pretty dismal place spiritually. And Eli is the leader. In chapter one, we can read it. He's not really understanding the needs of his people. Hannah calling out to the Lord, that's Samuel's mother, calling out to the Lord herself in her day of trouble. And what did the Lord do? The Lord helped her. He, uh, she glorified the Lord. Um, she found promises in the Lord God, the God of Israel, and quite a mighty things were being revealed that she didn't even know at the time. But she said, I'm prepared to lend you out, my son out to you, Lord. And Eli didn't even get up. He thought she was drunk. So Samuel doesn't know the Lord. Not as Eli's not a good teacher. But there must be something in Samuel that really just permeates everything around him that says, "No, there is no, there's no way that this young boy 
is going to find God. There's no indicators at all. We've got it here. Verse 7 says it. Verse 8, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose, went to Eli, and Eli said, and he said, Here am I, for you did call me. And Eli perceived that it was the Lord and called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he called thee, Thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And in that day I'll perform against Eli all the things which I've spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I'll also make an end. So what an amazing revelation. Samuel, this boy got talking to God, talking to the God of Israel in the middle of the night, not understanding the first three times. And when God called, we mentioned here already, he wants to prove himself. So obviously Samuel is quiet nights. And I know my time, in my testimony, many times at two o'clock in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, um, I was involved in some pretty natural sort of drugs and ended up getting a brawl one night with a friend of mine and um, the police came along and it's been a night in the jail and my mate, um, he's an Aboriginal guy, fat caught on him, he ended up in hospital and we got beaten up by the bouncers from this pub. I've got the mother of all hidings, I was sure, they were six foot ten. <laughs> the mother of all hidings on this particular night. Ended up going to court uh, later on. And there were times when you did call up on the Lord, you did call out to God in, in your quietness. In the, in, when it's the early hours of the night and there's no one but your brain, and if it was anything like mine, it was running 100 miles an hour in every which way. And to try and work out whether God was there, because occasionally the thoughts of God would come in, in amongst all this other jungled mess of, of my mind. And so the Lord got through, through someone witnessing to me, as did in this case Samuel, a little boy, lying in bed wondering, I'm taking a little bit of lies, but something tells us about Samuel, that God called him and that he must have been looking and wondering about the bits and pieces that he was hearing about God. He, he may have wondered or searched in his own heart and mind, but whatever was happening, God was calling Samuel. And Samuel answered, and what did he say? I'm going to show you things. So we know that he wants to help. He helped Samuel that night. And Samuel did spend the rest of his life glorifying God. That's the first bit about when we get called. The second point, he reveals his promises, and Samuel was certainly good at uh, proclaiming the promises of God. He anointed the first two kings of Israel. He was a great prophet, one of the great prophets and judged as well. He was a, a mighty man. There were two books of the Bible are named after his own personal name. We have a history about his life um, and how the Lord intervened in his life as a young boy, and spent his whole entire life in servitude to God. And the Lord showed things to Samuel, Samuel, he was able to reveal to the nation. When the nation at the time, in chapter 3 we read, there was no vision, open vision. Samuel was able to open uh, up the word of God to the nation because he, he, he heard the calling of God. As we do now, we know that we can rely upon his promises we do tell people when we've been healed, and we heard that today with Sister Alice in her testimony about what the Lord did for her life, even today, all these years, 43 years later. In fact, I've got to digress another point. Maybe Pastor David can verify this later on. For some reason, I woke up this morning thinking about Pastor David's testimony. I'm sort of wondering if I'm right about this, but I think you've received the Holy Spirit in a car, your work car, in Arlington, that nods in my mind. I'm not, you might be to tell me a bit later. I know that for other people going up this road at Darlington on their own 
you know, work vehicles calling out to God and they receive the Holy Spirit. And I, I was listening to Alice's testimony and she moved on about her own part, which she received. Um, and so the Lord, when we called out to the Lord, what has he done in our life? He answered our prayers. We talk to him. God is real. We tell him about God's promises in people's lives that they can be relied upon. And we're able to tell people at the end of the age because that's the calling that we have. We are the children of light. And we praise the Lord for that. Let's look at another story. Shall we go to the New Testament in, chapter, in Mark in chapter 2? So we're talking about Kui, C O O W E E. If you want to look that up in your encyclopedias or your Google, and you've got to do it right, you've got to go, Kui. There you go. Practice that. Enough. You can look up the history of the Dunkirk and see those particular callings, and they've been calling out for help. Um, you can think about. Michael Collins, as you're turning to chapter two of the Gospel of Mark, who was uh, one of the astronauts on the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. And he was in the, the um, lunar module Columbia that orbited around the moon 14 times while they were on, on the surface of the moon that's Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. The conspiracy, did they get there? Um, we know that they did. Well, it'd have to be it'd have to be a lot of lies out there and human nature is that we don't normally you normally boast and no one's broken rank yet, not even on their deathbed. And also when I was in London, there was an interview with Buzz Aldrin and he, he, he was being interviewed. He, he's, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, by the way, in this interview. He came back as an alcoholic, which is a counter things, and he was playing this guitar by a piano for some sort of church meeting. And they're interviewing him, and he said that when he came back from the moon with all the popularity, he became an alcoholic, couldn't handle the fame, he got him, called out to God. He met and quoted uh, Acts chapter 8, verse Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And he's talking about you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And he spoke about him being filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he turned to the camera and says, Now, those people wondered whether we got there. I can tell you, he was supposed to be the astronaut, the pilot. He was supposed to first walk on the moon, but Neil Armstrong, by all accounts, was the pilot. So he had to move over one of the capsules. So it meant that Neil Armstrong was going to be the first guy to land, walk on the moon. And he said, turning to the camera, I was so enraged with jealousy, as I'm looking at the camera now, that I opened up my camera and I took out all the film. If there's not one photo of Neil Armstrong on the moon, I won. When he took a photo of me and I'm in his visor, you can see his reflection of himself. I was so bitter with jealousy that I took the film out deliberately. That's why there are no photos of Neil Armstrong and the moon from his own mouth. Now, when I heard that, the human nature of jealousy, I mean, what the God was second instead of first, and you think all the billions, there were three or four billion people on the planet at the time, and there's only two that are going to walk on the moon. And I'm thinking, man, that's jealousy, that's human nature. I believe you now, <laughs> because no matter how far away they were from the earth, human nature was still following them. So, but Michael Collins, he went around the, the dark, the, the, the uh, far side of the moon, and he wrote a book about calling out to God at one particular time. And he said he felt so isolated. That he went on the back side of the moon, 47 minutes. He couldn't see the earth. He couldn't see the moon. All he saw was stars all around him in this capsule with a couple of white mites in the capsule with him and then he said i was overcome with an immense sense of fear i was on my own in solitude like no human being had ever been and then a moment later he called out to god in his own mind in his caption he said, oh god help me and then overcome with an amazing sense of serenity to real he said and when it came back the, the lunar came back so that we can tune with the earth he said i almost regretted it because this moment of time where it was just me and God and this amazing universe. And he felt peaceful about that. And he, but it started when he was actually scared. 
but he called out to God in that little capsule and God answers. And that's what he does, whether we're saved or unsaved. How many times, how many of us can face today of how many times the Lord answered our prayers for a new God? And he uses those indicators that would bring us to him eventually if we obey the calling of the Lord. And Michael Collins writes a book about that. And I just think that's quite amazing how in this capsule, he actually said, his words were, I felt not since Adam has any human being known such solitude as I had when I went to that part of the moon, I was, I was out of range, frequency with the earth. No one was talking to me. It's totally quiet. I was in this capsule, the cranking of the noise there, and it was me and God. But the first part of it, when he didn't realise that God was there and he just felt fearful of being alone on his own, he was frightened. And he called out to God and he was overcome with an immense sense of peace. So that's a history lesson there. Acts chapter, sorry, Mark chapter 2. Here's another calling. It says here, in verse 1, again he entered at Capernaum and at the same day, and it was noise that he was in the house, it's Jesus. And straightway many of the that were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about before. And he preached the word unto him, unto them. And they came unto him, bringing him at one of the palsy, which is a very sick, paralytic type of disease. Affects the nervous system, etc. So he was a very sick man, which was born of the four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they'd broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And Jesus saw their faith, and he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. There were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it's easy to say, uh, the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine own house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. That's a calling. It was their friends, good friends, that led this very sick person. Jesus Christ. And if you can imagine, I don't know what would happen, Pastor David passed board. If um, you had a house there in Fresno and all of a sudden you're in the middle of the talk and roof tiles are going everywhere and you're gyp rock and um, four men to, or four people, does it say men, four people, four friends to, decide to lower a very sick person down in the middle of your meeting and you, you have prayer and immediately they're healed by the power of God. Well, that would be the roof would become incidental. But you can imagine that in one way we've all been one of the people. There are times that we want to help people. Uh, there's an objection. We want to move the objections out of people's lives. That's how, what we do. People say they can't get, they need a lift and whatever. We, we try and get rid of the objections because we want to help people come to the Lord. We want to help them understand that calling. Eli did actually help Samuel in the end. Uh, so the objection is they couldn't get to Jesus. And many people around the world have difficulties in doing that. That's why our calling is so amazingly important. The three reasons I've already said. Number one, we have called out to God and he did hear us and we tell people. We're confident what Jesus can do, what the Lord can do in that person's life. Number two, we know of his promises. They, they work. We tried them. We learned of them. We come to the Lord, we hear maybe one or two of his promises, and then as we're growing on our walk in the Lord, we learn more and more of his promises, and they become an active part of our life. And three, we reveal to people the plan and purpose for that individual or the nations of the earth. And here's these four people just getting rid of the objections out of that person's life. 
he couldn't get there. He was sick. He had the pause. He had a paralytic nerve disorder. He was unable to get to Jesus. But his four friends did it. And how many times have you and I helped someone reach Jesus? They're calling, needed help. They couldn't get there. They had some sort of financial issue. Something in their life that prohibited them getting to there might have been persecution, whatever. We helped them, we walked with them, and then the church comes along where individual is so much more important than the building that we have. And off went the roof tiles, and off went the brick rock, and lowered down, and no one cared, no one cared because there was a miracle that was about to take place. And we were in the audience, maybe watching. But wondering what was going to happen next. We're hearing all the stories because we're feasting on the word of God or in this case, Jesus, we're feasting upon hearing what Jesus says or we're at a meeting place. And we're hearing about the wonderful things. Maybe Pastor David or Pastor Moore's given a talk or, or David's given a talk and they're expounding the word of God and we're just loving the meetings, you know, getting back together. And a new one comes along who's needed a lift, needed help in some way and we've We've gotten through to the calling of the Lord. And then what happened? How are we confident? We introduce them to Jesus Christ. We tell them that individual healing power of God, which four men knew that this man would be healed. And Jesus healed them. And imagine the individual coming, getting lowered down. He can't rely on anybody else. He's relying on, he's looking up. And he's got four of his friends that have got one corner of the bed with a bit of rope, lowering it down evenly until it hits the ground. Boom. And there's Christ. And somehow, you know that it's going to be okay. We bring people to our meetings or to our homes. We've got rid of the objections. They needed a bit of help. Uh, we've encouraged them to resist. The people are paying them out, ridiculing them or persecuting them. We're getting through all those obstacles and we know that when, they're, when they are at the feet of Jesus and Jesus calls them, we know that God will bless their life because that's what he's done for us. So our calling is a big, a really important calling. And it, it might be a case that sometime in the future that our church, the Fresno Revival Fellowship, will be the people saying three words. Um, that we've mentioned back here in Daniel. So it's three simple words. But if not, our church will continue to be a lifeline for people that need help. And if they have to come down to the roof of the building, we will help with whatever objections they have, whether they're 50 miles away or just down the road. We will remove the objections out of people's lives. We will teach them of what God can do. We will guide them through it and we'll tell them all what I can do. Last night, I was at the Flinders Medical Hospital. Just turned to Hebrews, by the way. Hebrews in chapter 11, just to finish on. Last night, I was at the Flinders Medical Hospital. We've got a sister, she's 87 years of age. And, and she talk, spoke to me last Sunday, two, two Sundays ago. And she said that... Um, her life is finished, she's got cancer, and that's probably the last meeting that she was going to get to. And uh, her name's Helena. So, well, Helena, we'll see what God can do, but I'm not going to have a different conversation with you and try and persuade you otherwise, but you've got a unique situation where you can sign out in a good way, the way you'd like. So, the next week, we're visiting her, we're going around there playing guitar singing her choruses because she's in a lot of pain. And then last night, she was sent to the Flinders Medical Hospital and she probably won't get out. 87 years of age and 1960, in a place called Moon to Bay, Pastor John and Sister Janet went there on the way to Adelaide. They're going out to see what, if, it, if there was any interest in the gospel. The moon is about three hours out of the country town outside of out of Adelaide, no, at all. And Pastor John and Mrs. Janet were coming from Port Lincoln, which is probably about a further two hours west of where Moon to Bay is. 
So they go there, they got married, Pastor John and Janet got married on September the 13th in, in 1960. And they arrived in Adelaide in the January of the 61. So in this 12 week period, they did some witnessing. One lady came along to the Lord, her name's Helena. And her husband didn't have anything to do with it. They tried to keep in contact with her, but she lost interest. Helena Thompson is her name. Last year, she's been with, we have a little place just near here, about a couple of kilometers from where we live, the Lunga Shopping Centre. We have a bit of an outreach. And they were giving out some brochures. This lady goes up, ah, Revival Fellowship. You know a bloke called John Coolman. Still around? And that we said, yep, yeah, still like she's old baptized by John in 1960. Been wandering around spiritually for yeah, 60 years. Well, yeah, nine, 60 years. She came along, she was going to all the different churches. And then last week she said, I'm glad, told Pastor John, I'm glad you stayed the course. I'm glad you didn't compromise because I found the truth and I'm ready to go home. Now that's a mighty calling and all the people said. That's Amen. a big calling. Amen. The Hebrews in chapter 11, it says here, um, verse 6, I think it was, without faith it is impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In a funny sort of a way, all these stories, Michael Collins, uh, the British naval officer, the, the expedition forces yelling out QE, our calling, uh, Samuel, in your own lives, in the lives of helping people come to the Lord, re removing their obstacles that might be in their way. It's the story of the man healed from the, the stretcher. Um, they're all acts of faith. Now, we don't know it at the time. The Lord reveals it. He reveals how faith works in our life. It's a bit of a mystery before we come to the Lord. Then we get baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. It's no longer a mystery. And in Helena's life, probably the next day or two, she'll go to sleep with the Lord. She's very happy about that. Her husband left her. Uh, the kids are scattered throughout all different parts of Australia. The family is us. And she, this is what she said. Only about a week ago, after 60 years, Pastor John, thank you for staying the course. Thank you for maintaining the message of salvation. And that's what we're doing here today, the Fresno Revival Fellowship. A great fellowship, great people, a great vision, the light of the United States of America. And we will be the people that will keep saying, but if not, no matter what comes our way, our church will be a beacon of hope and we'll be there to help get rid of all the objects, objections that people have that will make a way for people to find Jesus Christ. Because one, the calling that we know, he answers in a time of trouble and we tell people how good it was when he answers our prayer. Number two, he reveals his promises to us through that calling Number three, he shows us great and mighty things which we know not. He reveals his plan and purpose. And all the people said, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go on too long tonight, guys. I know it's very warm there. But um, God bless. We'll hand back to Pastor Ward. I'd love to know the final bit about Pastor David. Just a minute if I got that right. Okay, thanks, guys.